happening. All right, and with that, um, welcome everyone. It has been a while since we have done a virtual Tin Mountain program, so I have to sort of remind myself um, of our Zoom etiquette and programming, but thank you all for, for tuning in to join us. My name is Nora Dufalo. I'm the program director here at Tin Mountain Conservation Center. And before I introduce um, our speaker for this evening, I do just want to take a moment to thank Tin Mountain's Nature Program Series sponsors. Um, who are Hancock Lumber, White Mountain Oil and Propane, and Farm to Table Market in West Ossipee. Um, I want to just thank them for their financial support that allow us to put on quality programming such as this. I also want to thank those of you who are current members of Tin Mountain Conservation Center. Um, your membership dollars also go towards helping us fulfill our mission, including, um, you know, putting on um, great programming. Um, and in addition to the great programming that we have this evening, we have coming up um, for the remainder of 2023, um, I will will just put a plug in for three upcoming programs and events. Um, this Saturday, we have our annual Winter Greens Wreath Making Workshop. Um, the morning session is full, but we do still have a number of spaces in the afternoon session from one to three. Um, there is information and um, a registration link for that on Tin Mountain's website if you are, if you would like to join us. And I would encourage everyone, if you have never made a wreath before, uh, to try it out because, um, it is, it's a useful skill to have, and it is something that, that really everyone is, is capable of doing. Um, and, and because before we know it, December is going to be here. Um, that means winter bird ecology and the Christmas bird count. Um, and the Christmas bird count is set this year for Saturday, December 16th. Um, and in advance of that, we are hosting our winter bird ecology evening program, which is a great way to brush up for the Christmas bird count or just for, you know, feeder watching at your house. Um, and that is set for Thursday, December 7th. That program is actually going to be virtual um, as well and will be led by um, our former board member, Will Broussard. So, um, so always a uh, always a popular program. Um, so lots of things um, coming up at Tin Mountain. Um, but we are very excited uh, this evening. Um, not so much about the topic itself. I, I hasten to, <laughs> to use the term excited and spongy moth in the same sentence. Um, but we are very excited to have Logan Anderson um, back uh, to present or back on screen, I should say, to to present. For those of you who don't know, Logan is um, is our former resident bird intern. Um, and during his time, you know, his time at Tin Mountain, um, in addition to all of the point counts and veg surveys, um, you know, he happened to be there during um, the the defoliation of the Michael Klein forest from, you know, which got hit hard two summers in a row from spongy moth and, um, you know, saw that as a unique opportunity, um, you know, to look at the effects of these spongy moths on the bird communities there. Um, so really taking, you know, taking um, an unfortunate uh, event and, and turning it turning it over and looking at it as a research opportunity. Um, Logan is a graduate of Virginia Tech and um, is currently a graduate student at Kansas State University. So please um, join me in welcoming Logan. Um, as since it has been a while since we've done virtual programming, I will um, just ask that um, if you have questions during the program, um, if you want to type them directly into the chat feature, I will be monitoring that. Um, and 
Um, and we'll ask the read through those and ask those of Logan at the end of the program, at which point you are also welcome to unmute yourself um, and ask questions um, directly of him, but just so that we're not popping in and out of the um, of the program. All right. And with that, Logan, I'm going to hand things over to you. Sweet. Thank you so much for the introduction, introduction, Nora. <clears throat> It's really um, awesome to see some familiar faces out there. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about this research project, which, you know, I, I had first uh, developed in my first week or two at, at Tin Mountain and carried out kind of the statistical analysis and process, the scientific process throughout my time at Tin Mountain. Um, but I do want to give some context as to why I chose it. And, and Nora kind of alluded to the reason why um, I ended up going with the Spongy Moth project. but when I first arrived at Tin Mountain uh, in August of 2022, I, I missed that first exit coming off of 16 to go up Bald Hill Road and end up hitting the, the exit on Bald Hill uh, just up by the Dunkin' Donuts. And as I was coming up Bald Hill, I noticed all these trees on either side of the road were just completely defoliated. And at first I thought it was some like fungus or some sort of blight that was coming through and wiping out everything. but it, Basically, within the first day of me being there, the, the one of the trout interns at the time, Will BB, told me that spongy moss had hit the decline really hard. And it was, I mean, one of the first things I thought is how is this affecting the bird communities in that forest? And uh, so this is one of the projects I had first proposed to Katie and ended up being the one that we decided to go with. For some historical context on spongy moss, um, they were first released by accident in Boston. There was a, a French American um, insect uh, scientist, an entomologist who was keeping a terrarium of spongy moth adults for some reason next to his kitchen window. And of course, at some point he came home and realized that the, the cage was open and so was his window and the nearest patch of trees was his neighbor's yard. And so he went over to his neighbor being a, rel a pretty good scientist in what he knew was going to happen and told his neighbor to burn down the forest because he thought it would be a disaster if these things were ever to spread across the eastern US and his neighbor told him no and these things ended up spreading throughout New England within the first 15 years you can see on that map on the left and by the, the last few years they started reaching places like North Carolina and Kentucky um, this was not a an invasive species that I was particularly familiar with in Virginia up until relatively recently. Um, but as you can see with the pictures on the right, what they end up doing to forests, it looks pretty drastic. It doesn't look great. They remove the entire canopy layer, especially in deciduous woodlands. Um, and why would, why, so why would it be important to study spongy moss right now, given that um, they're really only in this relatively small area of, of the Northeast and Mid Atlantic? Well, as you can see with this map, in the light green, we have urban deciduous tree canopies. Those are tree canopies that are especially vulnerable to spongy moss, number one, because they're living in areas that aren't great for them to live in, urban areas. And, and number two, the climate in urban areas is, is really great for spongy moss. And then in the dark green, we have preferred hosts. So those hosts tend to be more deciduous. Um, we think of species like beaches and oaks. But we can see there's this huge block in the eastern United States and these relatively smaller blocks in the Rocky Mountains. And then we have another big chunk along the Pacific coast. Um, it's important to study the effects that spongy moths have on forests because we can think of something like a salamander. If we remove that canopy layer for a summer or two, we're drying out the soil, which is reducing the number of insects that can be supported in, within the leaf litter and within the first few inches of the soil layer. So we're reducing for number one, the number of insects that we have in our forests, but something like a salamander, which prefers moist soils be, to be able to breathe and, and respirate. If we dry out the soils, we might not see as many salamanders. And this might be especially pertinent for people uh, or for scientists in, in the Southern Appalachians where salamander diversity is so high. But we can also think of canopy loving species like this red-eyed vireo, which will be, uh, which use a canopy to nest, they use a canopy to forage. And if we reduce that canopy layer, they, we might see declines in species like that. But of course, we'll also see declines in, in our native uh, deciduous trees like oaks and beeches. And this is especially important when we're thinking about species of trees that produce mast or they produce some sort of fruiting um, item like an acorn or a beech seed. Uh, there's so many species, especially in eastern forests that rely on oaks, for instance, as a food source 
especially given in the last hundred years, we've lost some of our big mast species like butternut and American chestnut. So if we lose oaks, that's a really big, really, really big deal. We'll lose a lot of different bird species such as turkeys and, and quail in the southeast, but we'll also loon, lose a lot of mammal species like uh, different squirrel species, black bears, and at least we'll see reductions in those populations. But we can also see the declines in understory species, or at least understory species could show varying effects. I'll talk about potential effects that under that spongy moss ha might have on understory species um, later in the presentation, but we could very well see like uh, declines in oven birds across the range. And we might even see declines in brook trout. Uh, this is a species that really likes cold water. So if we remove that canopy layer on some of those streams where brook trout can be found, then we're warming the water and we could make those streams inhospitable for, for brook trout. So in total, if we're studying all these, these effects on the east, we could also look at potential effects that spongy moss could have on the Rocky Mountains and the, the Pacific Coast if they ever made it out that way. And I know it might seem, seem improbable, for the for something like a spongy moth to make it all the way across what seems like the treeless area right here in the middle that gray area. But I can tell you living in that area there's a lot more trees than you would think. And it would be very easy for something like spongy moth to make it across to the Rockies and then eventually the Pacific coast. So by studying some of the species that we have here in this area, we can make predictions about how spongy moss will affect species that might be more vulnerable to these changes um, on the Pacific coast, we can think of a lot there's a lot of endangered oak species in California that might be really negatively affected by spongy moss and we also have species like acorn woodpecker that are um, really reliant on those those trees for nesting and for food there's other uh, bird species like oak titmouse that also rely on on acorns uh, readily and then uh, we'll also we can also talk about salamanders out west too that readily rely on these mo moist soils and typically are much more range rest restricted than our eastern salamanders because there's so much dry land out there that kind of isolates different populations. So I, I see this Encetina, which is a species of salamander from California on there just to represent all salamanders and amphibians out there in, in the West. There has been some previous work to look at spongy moss and much of that work has been around forestry just because there's more money there. Um, but the effects that spongy moths have on the forests themselves, the actual tree species and vegetation that you can find in, in any sort of eastern forest has been very well studied. So the species that they tend to prefer and go after the most are oaks and beeches. I threw hickories on there too for um, areas further south of New England where hickory is more present. Um, but those are the spe those are like the donuts on the plate or the pizza. Like they that's what spongy moths are preferring most of the time. I mean if you threw for instance, uh, we'll say the oaks and beeches are pizzas, maples and birches are, are broccoli, and conifers and evergreens are graham crackers. You're going to want to go for the pizza first. That's your preferred one. The maples and birches, uh, they tolerate them. They, they actually kind of enjoy these species too, but they're not going after them as hard as the oaks and beeches. We can think of that as like broccoli. Like I prefer, I love broccoli. I'll eat it, but it's not going to be like pizza. I'm going to go for the pizza first. Then lastly, we have conifers and evergreens. And th this is like the graham crackers of, of the tree world for these guys. They don't want to eat them, but it's like a last resort. Like if, if they're starving, they will eat the graham crackers. We'll go after them. Uh, but the trees also react in, in varying ways. Your oaks, um, your deciduous trees from your oaks to your maples and aspen, they can take a number of hits before they, you can knock them down. Uh, from the literature I read, it was something like two to three summers of, of hard hits um, will trigger high death or high mortality in these populations. And in the conifers, they react differently because it only takes once. Once they get knocked back, they don't really come back from that because they're not adapted like maples and oaks are to even having um, these successive hits by any sort of insect at all because they have these waxy cuticles on their leaves. So you just knock, there's a study out of Cape Cod that looked at pitch pine. And once the moths hit the pitch pine after going after oaks and beeches, they just saw almost complete mortality in those, those trees because of that. And so that's especially worrying, but luckily we've, I haven't really seen any of that at Tin Mountain. So I think our forests are relatively safe from our conifers being hit by them. Uh, and there's also been some previous work with birds. There hasn't, there honestly hasn't been a whole lot, but a lot of the work that's been done has looked at 
uh, cuckoos. So in the Northeast, that would be yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoo and how they react to spongy moth defoliation events. They actually increase in population. These are huge caterpillar eaters. They, they don't mind eating the spongy moths, even though the spongy moths have a really spiky outer like epidermis or skin that most birds usually can't get through. But the cuckoos can do a good job of getting through the spines and they, they eat spongy moss and actually they'll show up more readily in areas with spongy moss than in areas that don't have them. And there's been some work to look at hairy woodpeckers and the research here has been conflicting. Um, there was a study that was done back in the, in the early 20th century that said hairy woodpeckers love spongy moss. And there's been some more recent work that's kind of disproven that. So, but I think it's still an interesting, I threw it on here and I actually did look into hairy woodpeckers and I'll talk about um, what, what happened with them in a little bit. Um, but we can also see that they would affect canopy species. Like I talked about with that red-eyed vireo, if you remove that canopy layer, there's species that rely heavily on a dense canopy. You can think of red-eyed vireo or scarlet tanager. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of research into this. There was one study in Connecticut that looked at breeding bird survey routes and it actually looked at, you know, looked at areas with spongy moth defoliation and areas without spongy moth defoliation. And they didn't see a whole lot of change in those canopy species. But I, I threw in some canopy species for my project just to see if there's any differences that I could detect. And then lastly, we have understory species. And there, in that same Connecticut study, the only understory species or shrub-loving species that they found that actually increased in spongy moth defoliation areas is house wren. Um, but I wanted to look at some other effects that spongy moths had on, on understory species. So something like a house wren loves a, a dense understory. And that would make sense if you remove the canopy of the forest, what else is there but more sunlight under the, that canopy now. So you can get a robust understory of shrubs and herbaceous, and a, robust, a, a robust herbaceous layer. So something like a house wren might be, do really well on a, ro, a robust understory, but you can think of something like an oven bird that might prefer something more mixed might not do as, as well as something like a house run. So that was some of the previous research. And, and I wanted to add to this by looking at these three field sites. Um, these should be familiar to, for, to most of the people watching, but um, I used three sites that are owned by Tin Mountain. Uh, the one that got hit the hardest there in the middle is Klein. Um, it, it was hit particularly hard in 2021 and 2022. Um, so that was the area of, of prime study. That was my experimental plot, you could say. Um, and then Rockwell, I added to the data set too, because I wanted that to be the control. Rockwell was not hit as hard as the Klein was. There were some areas, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but right there in the middle where there was some defoliation, but it wasn't as severe as any, any place I'd seen on the Klein. Um, so I used Rockwell as a control because it's right next to Klein. It's got, for the most part, the same forest makeup, at least initially I thought it had the same forest makeup, but I'll talk about some of the uh, challenges I had going um, with this study going a little bit later. And then lastly, I added bear paw on here. And bear paw initially was going to be my one of my controls as well, but I ended up doing bear paw as a completely separate kind of side of the project that really didn't deal too much with spongy moss. Instead, I really wanted to see what some of those patterns in those same bird species looked like at bear paw, especially given that bear paw is acting more like a natural forest would in that there's some disturbance that already occurs there. Um, you can see on the map there on the right there, I put, this is, a, this is from a previous study, but it lists some of those areas where there was actually some tree cuts that happened. And those cuts were made to simulate what a, a fire or an ice storm would do if it went through a forest. And so it's, it's, trying, it's theoretically acting like a more normal spot than, than Rockwell or Klein because Rockwell and Klein are protected for recreational and educational purposes. So we don't see that same sort of d disturbance go through Rockwell and Klein as we would at Bear Paw. And I chose five species for this project. I ended up going through somewhat like 12 over the course of the year I was at Tin Mountain, but some of them didn't work out as well just because we didn't have the population or the sample size I thought big enough to actually get anything, um, anything I could really talk about with. So these five species I chose because they're common, you can find them on all three properties, and I thought they would have some sort of reaction to spongy moths. So I chose two canopy species, and I predict predicted that both of these species would decrease as we lose that canopy layer because of spongy moths. The two species I chose are scarlet tanager and red-eyed vireo. I chose two understory species as well. 
um, one of them, the oven bird, I predicted would decrease because as you lose that canopy layer, you get, you're going to get a more robust understory. And, and oven birds typically don't like a complete understory or a very dense understory within a forest, and particularly a forest that's just being you're getting that robust understory across that whole stand. You're not just getting it in a certain section of it. Oven birds can do well in a mixed understory setting, but if you're at, if it, the whole understory is getting becoming more robust, then I think they're going to decline um, as a result of spongy moth defoliation. And I thought the opposite was true with black-footed blue warbler. This is a species that, um, if you're familiar with Tin Mountain, they love the mountain laurel thickets. They love a dense shrub layer. And I thought if we increase that sh shrub layer throughout the whole property, that we would see an increase in black-footed blue populations because of that. And lastly, I, I added hairy woodpecker on here. Um, I added it as the, the, sole, the sole species that would describe if um, uh, if there are birds that prefer worm or prefer the larvae of spongy moss that would increase as a result of that food being more available on the landscape. Like I said, hairy woodpeckers have kind of a mixed history. There's some studies that that kind of throw out the idea that they do eat spongy moth larvae. There's some studies that say they don't. So this, I didn't really know how this would, would shake up, but I was overall predicting that there would be an increase from, or in, in hairy woodpeckers on the property. You might be asking why I left cuckoos out of the study. And I will say briefly that cuckoos showed a significant increase on Rockwell and on Klein, but sadly, it just didn't feel like a big enough sample size to really make any large claims about that. <clears throat> it wasn't until later that I realized that my sample size was large enough but I still feel weird about saying, well, in years previous to the outbreak, we would see an usually zero cuckoos. And then in the year that we had an outbreak, either in 21 or 22, we would see two. And it might not seem like that big of a jump, but, jump, but statistically that was a significant change. Um, but I just felt like that was a, like I, I, I left them out of the, the study because it just didn't seem like that big of a jump to me for, for putting it in this. But, um, I'll go through some of the results I had. So the first bird I'm going to talk about is Scarlet Tanager. And, and I, for each one of these birds, I'm going to have two plots, uh, two line graphs. I have one on the left that'll describe the populations at Bear Paw. Each one of those colored lines is representing a different plot on Bear, at Bear Paw. And each plot had a different silvicultural um, cut at a different year. Um, and then the black line for, on both plots is going to describe the, the average of all of those point, those lines together. At Rockwell, all those little multiple, all those colored lines are describing different points at Rockwell. And those points are where we do our surveys at. And so those are just showing the, uh, the average number of birds per minute from 2014 all the way to 2022. And you might be asking, why are you doing average number of birds per minute at each point? That seems really stupid. But between 2014 and when Katie Lewis started in 2020 and 2021, we went from having a, a 10 minute survey to a five minute survey. So if you're comparing data before 2020, you're effectively almost doubling the number of counts that you could get because you're doubling the amount of time that you're spending at each point. So I did average number of birds per minute over the course of, of the past eight years, just so I could, I could look at a, a more balanced uh, view of, of the, pot, the abundance of these different species. So I'll start with, with bear paw first. And below the plot, you can see I put the mean number of birds per minute uh, before the outbreak and the mean number of birds per minute during the outbreak. And we saw a jump from 0.033 to 0.05. That was a 52% increase um, in, in scarlet tanager between these two periods. And then if we look at Rockwell, we see a 33% decrease. Um, and we can see that the mean before the outbreak here is 0.024, and the mean during the outbreak is 0.016, which again is a 33% decrease and it's significant. Um, and it doesn't seem like it's a whole lot, but you can see the steady decline in scarlet tanagers over time. And what I will say about this is, I don't know if this is due to spongy moths, because scarlet tanagers aren't doing well overall. And so I'm thinking this decline seen here at Rockwell is just indicative of what's going on with the population overall, and that there really wasn't any effect on of spongy moss here on Rockwell's property, uh, on the Rockwell property. Whereas if you look at bear paw, why do we see an increase, a 52% increase, by the way? I think it's because there we had all these different cuts, and over time those cuts are growing in, they're becoming uh, more mature and scarlet tanagers are taking advantage of that increased canopy. 
And then finally, I made a comparison between Rockwell and Klein. Remember, Rockwell is my control here, and Klein is my experimental area. And we actually saw a 17% decrease. And now, a 17% decrease between these two times, I would say, is is there's pro there's pro definitely a decline occurring here. But what this p equals 0 0.05055, 055, what that's meaning is that this decrease that we're seeing isn't statistically significant. And it's just a fancy way in science of saying, well, there's not that big of a chance that this is actually a decline. There's actually a pretty good chance that this could just be, the population could be staying stable, or there might even be a little bit of an increase. But because my sample size was so big, I'm going to say that there's a likely chance that that 17% decrease, it, there's something going on. There's probably some decline in Scarlet Tanager on Klein. Uh, because of spongy moss or maybe some other reasons. Next, we have red-eyed vireo. Uh, at Bear Paw, we saw a 40% increase in, in red-eyed vireo between those pre-outbreak years and those outbreak years. Um, and remember, spongy moss didn't hit Bear Paw. Uh, this, this site was safe from them. Um, but I think that increase that we're seeing is matching what I said with the scarlet tanager and that that canopy layer is becoming more robust, increasing. So red-eyed vireos are taking more advantage of that. Their populations are increasing at bear paw because of that. And if you look at Rockwell, we have a 25% decrease. And um, this is going to be a trend going forward, but Rockwell birds are not doing too well. And I'm not really sure why. But um, we see a 25% decrease. And it's if we look at those years 21 and 22, those are not too different from what's going on in 2019 and 2020. So I don't think spongy moths are having any effect here. I think what we're seeing is just like everywhere on the, in the East, we're seeing the steady decline in, in birds and, and red-eyed vireos are, are a part of that decline. And then if we look at Rockwell and Klein, we see a 65% increase. This is where I, I predicted red-eyed vireos would be decreasing. So why the heck are we having like almost double digit or a, a two-fold increase in, in, in red-eyed vireos here? here? I'll talk about some of the ideas I have a little bit later, but I will say this was baffling to me. When we look at Ovenbird, we have a 2% increase to, at Bear Paw. Um, so they're doing okay. They're just kind of riding it out. The habitat there has not changed for them in any significant way. And if it has, the population's not really reacting to that. We can also see this kind of cyclic um, pattern here where we have an increase and a, a decrease to 2019, and we're, we're riding that increase again. And I think we're, we're reaching a plateau here in 21 and 22 because that forest, as it's maturing, is kind of reaching like the maximum um, goodness for oven bird. They're, they're, it's reaching the maximum habitat potential, at least for the forest currently, as it stands. And then at Rockwell, we see a steady decrease over time. And um, these decreases, are continuing before the outbreak even hits. So again, I'm thinking that there's really no effect by spongy moss here, but an overall just mind boggling 70% decrease in oven birds on Rockwell. It's very sad. Um, and again, I'm not really sure what's going on here. I, I mean, speaking with the staff when I uh, was working there, it didn't seem like there was that big of a decrease or a change in the habitat um, during that period in time. So I'm not sure why there's this huge decrease in, in oven birds as a result, but Maybe after this uh, this presentation, we can spitball some ideas. Um, and then if you look, we compare Rockwell and Klein, we see a 38% decrease, which is more in line with how their populations are doing overall. With many forest birds, we're seeing around a 25% decrease in their populations. So the fact that we're seeing a 38% decrease in on um, Klein, I think uh, I think that decrease in at Klein is probably just representative of what's happening across their range. Um, and then we also have black that blue warblers. And as you'll recall, I predicted that these guys would increase. We're in, as we increase that shrub layer in the understory, we should be uh, increasing the number of black that blue warblers that are taking advantage of that shrub layer. Um, and so we, on bear paw, we see this initial increase followed kind of like the uh, oven bird here in this kind of cyclic cycle. And it's interesting because they're both understory species, so they might be reacting to similar um, changes within those forests. But we overall see a 25% increase, which I would also say is, even though it doesn't count as st statistically significant because we have a high p-value here, I would stay, still say there's, it's likely that 
black footed blue warblers are increasing at bear paw. But we see the exact opposite when we look at Rockwell. We actually see a 52% decrease. This decrease is significant, and we can see that occurring since 2015, which is again mirroring many of the species that I've talked about already. We're seeing this very steady decrease over time. Um, and then when we hit 2019, we see this leveling off and this kind of steady state within this population. And then when we compare Rockwell decline, we see a 35% increase. And this is where I start to think that this is where I thought started to think that maybe there wasn't maybe it wasn't great to compare Rockwell to Klein. Um, I thought the two the two uh, properties would be really alike, but if you've ever been on the Klein, you've noticed that there's old logging roads there. It's also where a lot of our mountain laurel is, and so I think with a mix of the logging roads creating a more robust understory and the mountain laurel the the high number of mountain laurels with on within the Klein. I think we're just looking at a difference between the number of black footed blue warblers between the two sites instead of looking at black footed blue warblers as they're changing over time. Um, so sadly, I, I don't think this, I, I couldn't really do anything with, the, with this result. I think it's just a reflection of the differences between the two properties. But I still think it's cool that this is showing that there is, there are more black footed blue warblers um, in a, there's a higher abundance and likelihood of seeing black footed blue warblers on the Klein when compared to Rockwell. The last bird I wanted to talk about is hairy woodpecker. And this was interesting because I was looking at the hairy woodpecker bear paw plot, and we were actually seeing a 25% decrease in hairy woodpeckers, which is contrary to what I said with every other species, and that we're having um, kind of an increase in, in birds as those trees mature, if those birds prefer mature trees, and a decrease in those species that. Um, that prefer a more robust understory as the trees are growing higher. But hairy woodpeckers, you'd think they'd increase. As those trees get bigger, they can actually use them as a, as a you know, as a, an area where they can forage or potentially even nest. But we've actually seen a, a small decline in hairy woodpeckers at Bear Paw. And then let's let's look at Rockwell. We see a 42% decrease at Rockwell. I have no idea what's going on here. I don't know if there's uh, there were more snags on Rockwell before 2020 that hairy woodpeckers were taking advantage of as a foraging area or a nesting area. And we're just seeing a reduction in the number of dead trees on the property. Um, or if there's something bigger at play that none of us researchers, ornithologists in New England are even aware of, but a 42% decrease was pretty um, mind boggling to see, especially given the idea that the forests really haven't changed too much on the property. And then when we look at the, the difference between Rockwell and the Klein, we actually do see a 14% uh, increase, which could be a result of the habitat differences between the two properties, or it could be a result of the spongy moss and the, the hairy woodpeckers taking a little bit more of an advantage because of their infestation. Um, and again, I'm not sure if I can really make any conclusions between the two sites, given that I've started to realize that they're more different than I initially realized. But there could be some something here uh, as well. Um, and what I forgot to mention between Rockwell and the Klein, and I'll, I'll rewind to this slide, is that the Klein was only added to uh, Tin Mountain's uh, properties relatively recently. We only have bird count data going back um, to 2021 from the property. So if, if you know the timeline, 21 and 22 is when we had our spongy moth infestation uh, or defoliation events. And we only have data from the outbreaks. We don't have data going before the outbreaks. And so that's why I was comparing uh, the Klein forest during that outbreak period to Rockwell pre-outbreak is because we have Rockwell data going back, I, I believe as far back as 2008. I ended up using data as far back as 2014, but that's why I compared the two sites. So when we actually look at comparisons between the species um, or the sites with each species, uh, we can see that um, there were only two species at bear paw that had any st significant change, or at least statistically significant change, and that was with scarlet tanager and red-eyed vireo. We actually saw increases at bear paw, and that made sense to me because bear paw, again, their trees are maturing, and so these species that pre prefer mature trees are increasing, so that, that made sense to me. Look at Rockwell, and we just see the de de uh, decreases across the board. And like I said, I had looked at about a dozen species overall. These are the five species I chose because I thought they would have the most statistical significance in this talk. But I will mention that all two do or a dozen species 
showed decreases at Rockwell. I think there might have only been one that didn't really show any difference. Um, and I don't know if this, there's a difference in the, the I don't know, the, the ability for um, of the resident bird interns to identify species or even count as, as many, or there, was, there might have been some difference between the, uh, the skill levels of, of the interns prior to the outbreak and during the outbreak, or there actually was some change, but I don't think it had to do with the spongy moths. I think that something bigger at play is, is occurring here, and it might just be that, like many, like most birds are declining, these results at Rockwell are just kind of mirroring those declines across all these species. And then finally, when we look at, um, we compare Rockwell to the decline, we actually see an increase in noted vireos. And like I said, I have just no idea what's going on here because all the literature suggests that red-eyed vireos love a robust canopy. But we know that during those outbreak periods, uh, Klein didn't have a robust canopy, uh, at least in its deciduous forests. And so maybe red-eyed vireos are using spongy moss as a food source. Maybe they actually like more open canopies than we originally, originally thought. But there is a significant difference between Rockwell 2014 to 2020 and in the Michael Klein forest 2020. 2021 and 2022. And then we also see a decrease, in, a decrease in oven birds. And this is the only thing that I predicted that would that actually happened um, besides bear paw birds increasing. But the oven birds decreased and I, I feel safe in saying it's either because of habitat differences between the two sites or that spongy moss actually did cause a deep, an increase in the robustness of that understory, which oven birds don't like. And so they decrease as a result of that. Um, and it could, all, of course, is also probably being mirrored by the fact that oven birds are declining um, across eastern North America um, anyways. I, I have a lot of questions going forward, uh, and I think there's potential for future uh, resident bird interns to, to capitalize on some of these project ideas, but why are red-eyed vireos increasing on, on the Klein, or at least there's this huge difference between Rockwell and the Klein? The, as a resident bird intern, we collected two sets of data. We collected bird data and we collected vegetation data. I think there's a project here that you could do looking at the vegetation data between the two properties and comparing that to the bird data between the two, the red-eyed vireo uh, data between the two properties. I think there's something there. I'm also disappointed because I didn't look at great crested flycatcher. It's that middle bird there. Um, great crested flycatchers, they love canopy openings. So Duh, they should increase when you open the canopy up from a defoliation event, such as a spongy moth event. Um, I, I should have looked at them, but I think there's something there if somebody wants to go back through the data and actually look at great crested flycatcher populations um, and, and see if there's any differences there. And I think there's some potential to look at future tree mortality. As, as these stands get older, there, there's surely some trees on Klein and maybe even Rockwell that have died because of spongy moths. And so, I would I would highly encourage any future resident bird intern to look at woodpecker populations because we if if we end up getting an increase in those snags and dead wood, we'll likely see increases in, in woodpecker communities or even uh, the community or the different species themselves. And of course, there needs to be some work on the vegetation itself. How are spongy moss actually changing the diversity and communities of of, veg, of trees and shrubs? and herbaceous species on the properties. And then also, this is something I wish I had gotten, uh, if I was able to do during my um, internship, I would have definitely looked into, but actually comparing the raw vegetation values themselves to the birds, uh, the bird abundance. I, I attempted to do this, but the, the statistical tests that I would have had to do were way beyond anybody's ability to, to be able to do with, uh, um, at, the, at the time I was, uh, at Tin Mountain. So this might even be something I look at. I still have the, some of the Excel sheets. I think as I learn how to actually compare vegetation values through different statistical analyses that I'll want to be able to compare the vegetation at Tin Mountain with some of those same bird species that I just talked about. Uh, and then I also want to leave uh, with a couple of notes. And that is we tend to think of invasive species as a huge negative. And this is not a, a presentation where I'm going to advocate that spongy moths are necessarily a good thing. But I honestly want to say I don't think they're as bad as people make them out to be. Um, traditionally, we've had these, these different disturbance regimes like fire and ice and snowstorms that came through. Um, but for number one, I mean, Tin Mountain got pretty close to 
catching on fire a couple years ago, if I remember right. That was before I got here, but um, fire used to be a, a more common disturbance on the landscape. It's something that's more that's suppressed more now, um, but we're losing our fire disturbance here. It's not as common as it as it used to be pre European colonization, and we're also losing our ice and snowstorms. Uh, I'm thinking back to that really, I guess, horrible ice storm that we had during the Christmas bird count last winter, but those are becoming less common across the United States. And ice and snowstorms are actually a disturbance themselves too, because they they as you've probably noted, take off many of those big uh, overhanging branches, which can uh, open up canopy gaps that allow for new growth to come in. Uh, and so those are kind of like a pruning disturbance where you're pruning down the trees that are in the forest. But I'm, I'm gonna leave it here with spongy moss and, and kind of conclude that spongy moss are acting kind of a, as a new disturbance regime. They're taking the place of fire and maybe even the place of ice and snowstorms um, as has become less common, be common because of climate change, uh, they're kind of taking advantage of that gap and actually creating some disturbance in the forest, which is creating, uh, oop, got my dog here, <laughs> uh, which is actually, actually creating some what, heterogeneity in the forest or mixes of different forest types together. Um, and so I will say that spongy moss, I think one of the things I'll conclude is, is that they may not be as, as negative of an effect on forests because they're acting as a, a, an agent of change, which can help increase diversity within forests. But also, I, I do want to say just through the, the preliminary data and results I was able to get from this project, that they don't have the overall like big effects on bird communities as I thought they would. Um, as you were able to see, um, let's see if I can rewind here. Um, there's not a whole lot of significant change here. There's only two birds that had significant change, and those could have been explained by other variables other than spongy moths. Uh, and with that being said, I do want to acknowledge uh, and thank Tin Mountain for hosting me for the whole of last year. I was there from August 22 to August 23, uh, and, and Lori Kinsey for um, being there as a mentor and just an overall great person and, and having like hosting me on. Um, throughout my visit there. And I, I wanna thank Katie Lewis uh, for being a great mentor and research manager in my time there and Rick Van de Poel for helping me look through my paper that I wrote um, as, as, as I was concluding the project. Um, and I also wanna thank uh, the interns that were at Tin Mountain with me over my time. I started off with Will, BB and Emily. They were the, the trout interns there when I first got there and they were just great roommates and people. And then I ended up leaving with Hannah Wait, uh, the current resident bird intern, and then Mike and Andrew, who were the trout interns. And again, they were just all around awesome people, great roommates, and just um, awesome people and friends to hang out with. And then lastly, I want to thank the, the Tin Mountain staff uh, for just being so such good hosts to me while I was there. And, and I ended up becoming really good friends with, with many of the staff members as a result of my time there. Uh, and I should say, I, I forgot to mention, I, I just want to thank New Hampshire because it was an awesome state to be able to, to explore and bird uh, while I was living up there and, and ditto to Maine. Maine was awesome. Um, but with that being said, are there any questions? All right, Logan, thank you so much um, for that. Um, in terms of questions, there's one that came in during your presentation um, and you know, you had mentioned with a number of the birds, the, you know, just the decline in bird populations at the Rockwell Sanctuary. And so mm -hmm. the question, um, the question was, does the higher incidence of human activity account for bird species decline in the Rockwell Sanctuary? That's a great question. And I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be the person to ask if if the number of people has increased and at least their presence on the property has increased since 2014, since I was only there from 2022 to 2023. Um, I I don't think there's a that big of a, or that I don't think there's enough people that traffic through Tin Mountain, at least Rockwell, for there to be a, a change like that. I mean, at least I, I was there in 22 and 23. So if you're thinking that, you know, the people are the ones changing the number of 
the amount of birds on the property. I've seen sites with way more traffic that probably aren't seeing the same declines that we're seeing at Rockwell. So I don't think it's the people. I think there's it's I think there's maybe other things that maybe go beyond the scope of of Tin Mountain. It might be the whole Mount Washington Valley is seeing these declines. Um, just at, at sites similar to Tin Mountains, because of course Brock or Bear Paw didn't see those same changes, but their forests are all are different than Rockwell's and Klein's. Yeah. Is there any validity to uh, the the yearly nature of the spongy moth infestations? As in, sometimes you hear it's every three years, sometimes you hear it's every seven. Is there anything to that at all, or it just happens when it happens? I think. <laughs> It's ha it happens when it's hap when it happens, but the good thing is, is they are predictable because they're cyclic, like you had mentioned. They kind of come in, in intervals, and it depends on the area where you live. Um, but even if you're unfamiliar with maybe the cycle in your specific area, in the years leading up to a major infestation event, their population is still increasing. It's just in those last year or two before the infestation where you see this exponential growth. Right, it goes from a few hundred individuals to, to thousands or tens of thousands um, because they're 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 able to reproduce that way. Um, I also think it's probably dependent on the tree makeup in your area because I had mentioned that they like deciduous trees more than conifers. And I'm sure if you looked north of the White Mountains, you probably would see a, a longer interval in between those those defoliation events. Whereas if you look south of the White Mountains and you get into more of your northern hardwoods, uh, you'd probably see those intervals at, at more frequent rates. I know when you get to warmer temperatures too, they tend to do warmer, or sorry, better at warmer temperatures. So as you maybe move into the mid Atlantic where they're spreading, you could see that every couple of years. But I, I'm not, I'm not totally sure what why that interval is different between sites. You you may have mentioned that they're not all that bad, but when you're walking through a heavily infested area. Yeah. The frass is pretty disgusting. Yeah, I can imagine. In but that's boots. another thing that could could be good for the forest because they're taking that nutrient layer from the canopy and they're putting it back in the soil. So you're you're not only causing a disturbance, but you're actually they're actually doing some nutrient cycling uh, while they're destroying the canopy. <laughs> Which I know it sucks for us, but like for animals and wildlife, it actually might not be so bad. Yeah. Cool. Hey, Logan, this is Rick. I uh, I read something, I think, within the last year that said that, um, <clears throat> well, it looked at a lot of different passerines, but it said that red-eyed vireo populations were actually overall on the rise, and there was no explanation for that. And I wondered how, uh, it, well, one, are you do you agree with that? And two, does that factor into what you looked at here in, mm -hmm. in your I think there, I think there is some. You could maybe make some conclusions on why red-eyed vireos are are increasing in population if you look at the entire breeding population, because like many birds, they're moving north, and so those areas in the southern part of their range, it might it might be acting like a funnel. So at the southern part of the range, there's less area where the red-eyed vireos already are. So the declines as cli the climate's warming down there beyond what they can tolerate. Okay. is moving more slowly than if you look at the northern more part the northern parts of their range where you might see like expansions that are happening a lot more rapid than those declines in the southern part of the range as they're being pushed north but at a place like tin mountain i don't think those declines are i think there's there's the declines across new england and probably many areas in the mid-atlantic just because um their populations and their wintering grounds aren't doing too well and so the areas where our birds go in the winter are probably not doing as well as is some other areas that are more successful, particularly the birds that are on the northern front of their range. So it, you can look at eBird trend maps if you go to the science tab on eBird, and it'll show you which areas specifically are having declines and increases according to eBird data. Okay. But if I remember right, New England's not doing well. So that's okay. what that was referencing. Okay. Well, that would that would lend credence to what you found in your numbers on Tin Mountain property then. Yeah, and, and I would say anecdotally that the the last outbreak, these things were eating hemlock and white pine. Yeah. Definitely hemlock. They'd get different 
sections of the trees. Some of them, some sections of the trees are still dead, and others are other parts are living. Seems they to were me. eating the graham crackers. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, they were they were big. Well, might have just been the saturation, but <clears throat> but I'm also confused because, and again, anecdotally, but I've got several uh, pretty large uh, oak trees on my on on my lot and adjacent to my lot and uh <clears throat> they uh they all survived but then adjacent to bald hill there was an area where hundreds of oak trees died and i i wonder why where the oak trees died because of the sponge moth infestation yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i was okay. saying rick bartlett didn't get hit Bartlett got hit hard for one year I think part of the issue is that um Bald Hill got hep like where we were um got hit heavily two years in a row so yeah uh, okay. you know I think that that's an added stress um and then you know I, there was the question for this summer but because I, I think because of the weather patterns that we had you know and the the cold you know wet favors the virus and the fungus that you know that keep them in check we didn't see you know that third you know a third year of you know of heavy outbreak here right okay good thank I, you i think yeah like echoing what nora said uh, you know trees are under different i mean they can't move to get different resources they're just kind of like they're put in a spot and they kind of have to do what they can with what they have. <clears throat> so trees that are in poor, poor soils or soils that just drain quicker are probably under more stress than birds that are doing or are on better soils. And so just any added stress is going to increase their chance to die. Um, so th that should answer that. I, I don't know how the soils are at Tin Mountain. Like, and oh, I, the other point I wanted to make was that it could be that we didn't have a third year for spongy moss because they did so well this this 2022 that they ate themselves out of house and home and, and literally just all died because they didn't have any food left and so we saw a crash maybe because they just ran out of food and so they they might have just declined because of that i'm not sure i i have a question um i in 22 20 20, yeah, I, oh my God, 2022, I got like uh, three different companies knocking in my door, offering me that they will spray my trees and I cannot get the, the spongy moth. That was before the summer. That was like a, a, a springtime. And uh, I, you know, I, uh, you know, I say, well, I don't think there is any you know, a spray that you can do against this and things like that, and, and I let it go. But is it, is, is it possible to have any spray? Because uh, I know that in what it was, I mean, uh, I mean, there are trees that are, you can spray, but not from a sponge much, but from other uh, uh, bugs, and uh, they can, you can help them to survive. Yeah. Is it any spray against this or no? I I don't know if you can. Does anybody know if there's a specific spongy moth spray or is it just a generic insecticide? I think the generic insecticides that kills everything, bees and everything. Yeah. yeah. Oh. yeah I, I, mm -hmm. sorry, sorry. Well, if it's no. a generic insecticide, I would say it's probably best not to do it because your insect communities outside of spongy moths probably wouldn't do well because spongy moths are, are increasing, so they're eating everything to the point that other insects probably wouldn't be able to eat too much. But those insects are still there. They're just less of them. Whereas if you used a spray, you're killing all your spongy moths, but you're also killing all the other insects. And then spongy moths typically are, are doing well off the property, off the trees that are being sprayed, so they can just come back on those trees. Once those trees have kind of dissipated that spray at, at whatever point it is. So I would probably advocate about with like, against not using the spray, I I think they they're not that bad anyway. Like to the point where you should be spraying your trees down with insecticide. Don't uh, worry, I am against chemicals. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs>
That's what I like to hear. Chemical plastic. Yeah. <laughs> Favor of recycling. Yeah. Sometimes I forget I'm talking to a very sustainable and nature oriented audience. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question, Logan, or maybe just something to speculate about. Um, I, hi. <laughs> um, first of all, your presentation was awesome. Thank I'm you. very happy to see this. Um, and I, I found it really interesting that there was such a decline in most, if not all of the bird species on Rockwell that you noticed. And when there's also, to my knowledge, not a huge, like nothing major that happened recently besides for just bird populations in general declining. And that made me feel curious about if that might not even necessarily be something that's happening on the Rockwell property, but potentially just the perils that they face in other areas and times of their life during the migration period and overwintering, like you said, with the vireos. Um, and I know, especially outdoor cats and window strikes are huge uh, drivers in that. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if it could be maybe interesting to look at like migratory versus non-migratory species on Rockwell and see if there's a difference there in mm -hmm. their population increases or decreases. Yeah, I think that's an awesome question. Um, I, I, I think 11 of my 12 species were all neotropical migrants or at least migrated to even maybe the Southern United States. I think the, the shortest distant migrant I looked at was house wren. So it's like wintering in, in North the Carolinas and Georgia, but the only bird that I used, actually I used two birds. The only two birds that I used that were residents were downy woodpecker and hairy woodpecker. And I'm forgetting what happened with downy off the top of my head, if that was like the one bird that didn't do anything or not. But hairy woodpecker did decrease by, was it 42%? Um, yeah, 42% on Rockwell. So I, I mean, that's pretty, and it was a significant, statistically significant decrease too. So, I mean, it would be super interesting. I, I just don't, I don't know what it would look like. Like if you looked at chickadees or know, anything else, like any other woodpeckers. All right, this is Tony. Um, I, I was concerned in looking at the data that it seemed as if 2019 was a kind of a switch year where things looked fairly stable up until then. And then all of a sudden, starting in 2019, the numbers were way down. Mm -hmm. And as a forest scientist myself, I've looked at a gazillion uh, graphs of this sort. And uh, the first thing I always wonder about is uh, whether there was any uh, change in methodology uh, that might have caused something like this. Yeah, so the biggest change within our methodology uh, happened in 2021 when Katie joined Tin Mountain. She switched uh, to having a five minute point count, which is our standard use, our standard survey technique for counting birds in our forests. To She switched from a 10 minute to a five minute point count. And so I tried to account for that in those graphs by instead of saying number of birds per point, it was number of birds detected per minute. Uh, so that way I could try to rule out that bias that would have happened when comparing years prior to that. I don't think there was any change in 2019, but you could see in some of those graphs that there were declines that were pretty steady up until 2019 and 2019 is when they kind of, they didn't necessarily rebound, but it's, it, they hit kind of the bottom of what they would be. Seemed like at. a bottom year in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what, why that would have been. Um, I mean, that was the year prior to COVID and across the board, if you look at 2020, bird bird numbers increased, not because they were actually increasing, but because more people were out counting them, yeah. um, which doesn't have anything to do with the study, but it it is kind of odd that you see kind of this opposite, you see this decrease in the number of birds detected then. Um, it could be sur surveyor bias. I don't know who the bird resident bird intern in 2019 was, but they could have been uh, underestimating counts while, while people after or before were overestimating um, 
and some of this stuff can be a little subjective. We try to take that most of that out, but I mean, ultimately it's, it's people counting the birds. So there's going to be something, you know, in there, but. All right. And are there any other questions for Logan? All right. Well, Logan, thank you so much for, um, you know, I know that you're very busy with, with grad school and, you know, and things in Kansas. So we appreciate you taking the time to, you know, to pull together this presentation and, um, and share it with all of us. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Yeah. Nice work. Nice work, Logan. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Logan. Keep in touch. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>